Okay, Charlie and Hadley, I think we're going to start doing two chapters at a time because they're kind of short. So the next one is chapter 9, Blast Off. David opened his eyes and everything in the house was dead still. He listened, not a sound, except now and then the scratching of a bush against the side of the house. He leaned over to look at the clock by the side of the bed and it said a quarter past eleven. That meant he had just three quarters of an hour. Quietly, he slipped out of bed and in a puddle of moonlight, for it was a fine, clear night, got into the winter clothes his mother had laid out for him. This was a thing he still couldn't understand. How calm she had been, putting out his corduroy trousers and his plaid woolen shirt and his muffler, and all the time talking matter-of-factly about the journey and wishing him bon voyage. Now he zipped up his leather jacket and quietly, ever so quietly, stole into the kitchen and got the biggest bag he could find from the middle drawer on the right side of the sink. Then he got a loaf of bread and put it in, and also two boxes of cookies. Next, he opened the refrigerator and got out some tomatoes, but put them back because they might get squashy. A head of celery, some carrots, some lettuce, five wienerwursts, a package of sliced ham, a package of sliced cheese, and some oranges. Then he opened the drawer under the refrigerator and he got out four bananas and six apples. He looked in the bag, but his heart sank, for it didn't seem nearly enough for a voyage into space. So he opened the cooler and found a package of dates, a box of raisins, a cellophane bag of shelled nuts, another box of cookies, a bar of cooking chocolate, some candy, and a jar of peanut butter. That would have to do, David said to himself, even if they did starve before they got to Basidium. But he was terribly worried, so he got out the last loaf of bread from the bread bin. Then he started to pick up the bag, but how surprising, it would hardly budge. With a tremendous effort, he hoisted it up into his arms, staggered out the back door, and just made it out to John and Mrs. Pennyfeather's coop, before he had to put it down again. Maybe it was all the winter clothes he had on that made carrying the bag so hard, because certainly there was scarcely enough food in it to last them the first 500 miles. Then on he struggled, and there, at the bottom of the cypress path, was Chuck. He, too, was breathing heavily. Couldn't find very much, his Chuck, out of the shadows, but I guess it'll have to do. David hoisted up Chuck's bag, and it was, if anything, weightier than his own. All the same, he felt gloomy, he wondered what it would be like to starve to death in the middle of space. Down at the cave, however, where they could just make out the soft glimmer of their spaceship snug inside, David got that tight feeling in the depths of his stomach that meant he was unbearably anxious for the adventure to begin. They put their bags down and they went in. So one on each side of the spaceship, they wheeled it down onto the sand. They wedged their heavy bags of food under the seats and then, with much struggling and hauling and heaving, got the spaceship up and did it near a huge rock. The beach was flooded with moonlight, for the moon was within two nights of being full, and in that clear, soft brilliance, the rock looked like an enormous, shaggy giant with some sharp object from another world resting in its grasp. Shadows were deep black, and half-shadowed, half-revealed in its gleaming beauty, with its slim nose pointing straight upward, the spaceship seemed already eager to be free of the Earth. It seemed almost alive and to be tensely awaiting at the moment of takeoff. The boys stared for just a breath while the waves fell upon the sand, and somewhere far off a single shorebird gave its long, plaintive cry. Then Chuck turned. I remembered my flashlight, Dave, he said in a low voice, but I forgot the auto robe. I should have brought that, too, in case it gets awfully cold. Forget, remember, an appalled look came over David's face. The canning jar, he groaned. I forgot it, Chuck. The canning jar for Basidium Air. What'll Mr. Bass say? It's too late to go back for it now. But Chuck gave his arm a comforting shake. Never mind, Dave. I brought some sugar in a canning jar, he said. We can just dump the sugar out. David felt as though he had been stretched like an elastic band and then snapped back again. Okay, Chuck, he sighed. Let's go. Are you ready? Chuck gave a look, slow and solemn, all around the beach and then up at his house as though he had an idea he might never see them again. Yes, he said at last. Yes, I guess I am. But just then, just as they were about to climb up the rock and get into the ship, David had another awful thought. Chuck, the mascot! We forgot to bring the mascot! Oh, golly, exclaimed Chuck in despair. Now what are we going to do? We haven't got time. It's... And he pushed back his sleeve and peered at his watch. It's just ten minutes of midnight. Mrs. Pennyfeather, cried David. How about Mrs. Pennyfeather? It wouldn't take a minute to get her. Or John, maybe, said Chuck, scrambling up the beach after him. No, not John, puffed David, running as fast as the sand under his feet and his thick shirt and his leather jacket would let him. He's no good. We need somebody friendly. Up at the chicken coop, David unlatched the gate and stole carefully inside. He knew that if he woke John and Mrs. Pennyfeather and their children all at once, there would be the most awful cackling and squawking and goings-on. Silently, he drew back the door of the henhouse and put his head in. Mrs. Pennyfeather, he whispered, it's just me, David. Quack! 
cried John indignantly, and you could tell by his tone that he'd been startled out of his wits. Quack, asked Mrs. Pennyfeather sleepily, and from the other perches there came disturbed rustlings and creepings and drowsy murmurings. David crept toward Mrs. Pennyfeather's perch. He put his hand out gently and stroked her back and head, and then as gently as he could lifted her into his arms. Quack, remarked Mrs. Pennyfeather in her soft, comfortable voice, and she didn't seem in the least disturbed or annoyed, so David stole out of the hen house again to where Chuck waited. Get a bag of feed, Chuck, he said. There's three in there, medium size, not too heavy. You can drag it. Oh, gosh, protested Chuck. You mean all the way to the beach? But all the same, he went in and presently returned, dragging a dark, sagging shape. Why a whole bag, he whispered furiously. Don't know, said David. Got a hunch we'll need it. Off they went. It was a frightening job getting that sack of feed up the, on the craggy rock. Once on a level with the spaceship door, they had just let it slide down inside and pray it wouldn't damage the oxygen urn. Chuck climbed in with Mrs. Pennyfeather, and then David got in, and they strapped themselves down tight and safe. You'll just have to keep holding Mrs. Pennyfeather, Chuck, because when we get out far enough, she'll float around, and that might upset her. Now for the controls. He got Mr. Bass's paper out of his wallet, and by the glow of Chuck's flashlight, he read out the directions and set the controls accordingly. There now, that puts us on the beam, on the, what, what do you call it, the right vector, and we don't have to worry. But then, just as David was folding up the paper again and putting it into his wallet, Chuck struck his hand on his head in horror. Oxygen, he cried out. At once he put Mrs. Pennyfeather into David's arms, unstrapped himself, dropped down to the rear of the ship, and in a moment or two was standing up a small whistling like a peanut wagon. Feep, feep, went the escape valve in the urn, and this small whistling kept up for the whole of their journey. Once more, Chuck strapped himself down. Time, Chuck. Midnight precisely. And they grinned at one another because that was Mr. Bass's word. Ready, Chuck? Ready, returned Chuck in a low voice. Well then, said David, and his blood seemed to halt in its flight. Let's go. Now the boys crunched down as though they expected to be struck. David pulled back the stick and pressed the button, and with a roar and a great cackling burst of flame, the spaceship shot straight up, 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 over the moonlit ocean. For a few seconds, it was terrifying. Everything seemed to happen at once. First, there was the blasting roar, and the boys were flung backward in their seats so violently by the forward impact of the ship that the breath was knocked out of them. At the same time, poor Mrs. Pennyfeather lost her wits entirely and squawked and flapped and flew in their faces, beating her wings so wildly that they were completely blinded by her. But then, as the spaceship shot smoothly upward and there was nothing to be heard in the steady peeping of the oxygen urn, they got their breaths again and Chuck collected at the terrified and trembling Mrs. Pennyfeather. Gradually, their hearts stopped pounding and they became calm. Now, surely everything had been taken care of. Now, at last, they could look out of the window in peace and see how they were ascending, straight and swift and sure, into the blue-black, silent midnight skies. And there still hung the moon, David noticed in wonder, looking at them as serenely as though an absolutely unheard of event had not just taken place. Chapter 10, Into Uncharted Regions For a long time, the boys said nothing, but sat without moving, without speaking, staring all around. Firmly and noiselessly, their ship sped on, and yet, David asked himself suddenly with a sharp pang of fright, why should their flight be noiseless? He listened, and there was nothing, nothing but the little whistling of the urn. Was something wrong then? He had just started to cry out in terror when his mind replied to his fear. He recalled something that he'd read. They had broken through the barrier of sound, and at this appalling speed, a speed at which most human beings on earth would have no desire to travel, he and Chuck were leaving sound lagging far behind. He was stricken with awe and relief, and feeling too exhausted to tell Chuck all this, turned to the window once more. Now, as they left Earth's atmosphere, the two boys stared in wonder at the stars, those far-off suns billions and billions of miles away. Red and white and blue and blue-white they burned. Like points of fire, they blazed in the velvety firmament, and the greatest of them were Vega, Deneb, Anatares, Octarus, Spica, and Regulus. At this hour of midnight, the Milky Way was just rising along the eastern horizon, and of its constellations, the Northern Cross and its brilliant star Deneb was to be seen in the northeast, and Scorpius, jeweled with the red Antares, was in the southeast. High in the mountains, David had seen the stars sparkle as he had never seen them in the city, but now he knew that neither he nor any other earthbound creature had ever seen them in their true glory, and because he would have liked his mother and father to behold the sight too, he thought of them. He thought of his mother sitting on the side of the bed and saying quite calmly, But of course you must go, David. If Mr. Bass says his people are in danger, there is no reason you shouldn't try to help them, though it may be very difficult. What did you say the name of the satellite is? Basidium X, David had reminded her. 
or at least that's what Mr. Bass calls it, Basidium because he's so sure the mushroom people live there and X because it's still unknown. That is, to everybody but Mr. Bass and Chuck and me, he finished proudly. We don't know what astronomers or spacemen will call it when they discover it 10 or 20 years from now. 10 or 20 years from now, I see, his mother had said in a faint voice. Then she was silent, as though she were trying hard to arrange all this in her mind. Well, David, she said finally, you just go to sleep now, and perhaps you'll find your little planet. Then she'd gotten up, and just as though she were getting him ready for a trip to the mountains, gone about laying out his winter clothes, humming to, him, to herself. He hadn't been able to understand this. She hadn't seemed worried at all. Was Captain Tom worried, Chuck? David asked suddenly. Did he make any fuss about you coming along? No, he didn't, replied Chuck, and he just sounded puzzled. He didn't bother a bit. He looked at me sort of sideways, and he wondered whether I was telling a whopper or not. Then he chuckled and said, Go to it, Chuck, go to it, and good luck to you. Keep a sharp eye to the starboard sun, and don't go to sleep at the wheel. And I said, Do you mean it, Grandpa? Do you really mean I can really go? And he said, Of course you can go. Now you go get to sleep. Sleep's good for a man who's got a long voyage ahead of him. Then he went off whistling, just like I was going fishing or something. Funny, isn't it? Yes, it was a funny thing. But here they were, and everything was all right at home. No one was worrying, no one was sitting up and stewing about them, and that was a good feeling. You know, Chuck, I've been wondering about this word basidium. What's it got to do with the mushroom people? So before I went to bed, I had a look in my dictionary. And you know what, Chuck? It's in there. And you know what it means? It means, now, what was it? I memorized it. And here, David screwed up his eyes in order to remember better. It means a form of spore-bearing organ that characteristic of all Basidius sectus funguses, I mean fungi. Wow, said Chuck, what a mouthful. And fungi are rusts and smuts and mushrooms and puffballs. And I looked that up too. But first it said any group of thallophytic plants, including the rusts and smuts and puffballs and mushrooms. Thallow Street, exclaimed Chuck. Which probably means, went on David, that Mr. Family, Mr. Bass's family here on Earth have lived there for years and years and years, maybe gave that street its name because of the kind of work they've always done. Still, it's awfully funny we've never noticed it before, isn't it? Seems to me, said Chuck, there's lots of things that are funny about Mr. Bass. Not funny to laugh, but funny peculiar. Then he yawned and yawned until his eyes watered. Wonder what Mr. Bass is doing right now, right this minute. I'll bet not sleeping. I think he sits up all night and reads and never needs any sleep at all. Well, I'll bet he's sitting on that high stool in his observatory, charting our course on his map of the solar system. And I'll bet he knows exactly, and I mean precisely, where we are. Then, thinking of where they were, thousands of miles out into space already, came a question into David's head. Chuck, why do you suppose Mr. Bass said we'd have to travel at 25,000 miles an hour? Chuck grinned. Now he'd have a chance to show off a little. David didn't know everything. Captain Tom and I talked about that last night, and he said that we couldn't get away from the pull of the Earth's gravity unless we traveled seven miles a second. And when you multiply that all out, you get 25,000 miles an hour. See? If we didn't travel that fast, we couldn't get away from the Earth. We'd just fall back toward it. Now, thinking of Mr. Bass's wonderful inventions, like the fuel that was blasting them toward Basidium, and of his uncanny knowledge of so many things, David all at once remembered something else that had contradicted this and made his heart sink. On the radio, faintly from the other room, just as he was falling asleep last night, he'd heard storm warnings. All fishermen and owners of small craft in Monterey Harbor are urged to put out extra anchor and chains, said the newscaster. This is going to be a humdinger, so the weatherman tells us, and it'll be here early tomorrow morning. But Mr. Bass had said nothing about a storm. Was it possible he hadn't known? Perhaps there were many things, after all, that Mr. Bass didn't know. And yet, there was something he had told them very gravely and seriously never to doubt. David frowned and drew up a deep sigh, turning to Chuck. But there was Chuck, his head slipped down against the window, fast asleep, and in his arms, fluffed into a warm round shape of softness with only the tip of her red comb showing, was Misty, Mrs. Pennyfeather, fast asleep too. And that's the end of chapter 10.